It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Reaction being the yo 536. That in that neighborhood, my brothers and sisters. It is Wednesday once again, my friends. So y'all know we're about to go back to my from that chapter. That chapter Wednesday, y'all. It is always a delight. When we get to go back to Mike. And the title of this video is. How a missing girl led to a trailer of horrors. Now I'm just thinking y'all. From the title. It seems to me that. A girl went missing. And then when you know the police and stuff. Started doing their investigation. They got led to the path of this trailer. And found out that it wasn't just the girl. That was in this trailer. It was a lot of other people bodies. You know what I'm saying man. I don't freaking know what really in this trailer. But I'm pretty sure. It's about to be horrible. But. Before we check this video out. And just see how crazy it is. My brothers and sisters. Y'all know what y'all got to do. Get whatever you may need. Get what you need, please. We back to Mike. From that chapter. Y'all got what y'all need. Y'all ready to go. Then let's in go. Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike. And in this solo video, when a young couple decided to just get away, to leave everything, to leave their their small town life and its small town ways, little did they know that just moments into their brand new life, it would it would end in the most horrifying of ways. They encountered a monster who, even during my own research, and you know, for those of you who've been here for a while, I've covered a lot of monsters. And this one even kept me up at night just thinking about him because he's, he's very, he's a little bit scary. So many urban legends start right with this guy. He gave me a lot of, genuinely gave me a lot of sleepless nights, which I'm gonna pass on to you. You're welcome. Please subscribe to this <laughs> kind of thing. Mysteries, crime, spooky, if my kind of thing is also your kind of thing. Now, let's give it a go. Let's give it a go. Get whatever you may need. And if Mike's saying that it kept him up, or that he was dreaming about it at night or whatever, I'm pretty sure it's going to do the same thing to me, man. Because it is certain stories, not even just that we have watched from Mike, just stories, period, from all these channels that we watch. Well, some of them be having me thinking about it at night before I go to sleep, or randomly thinking about it while I'm at work. You know what I'm saying? Some stuff just stay on your mind. Let's see if this does. I'm pretty sure it is. Let's go. Just to the southeast of Houston lies a little area, well, back when this story takes place, a little area called Pasadena, Texas. These days, about 150,000 people live there. Back though in 1990, it was just a little more than 100,000. It's a suburb of the big city and it's a tight-knit community. You know, it's quiet, it's calm, and it's within sight of, of all those refineries that dot the area between Houston and Galveston. The funnest fact you can learn about Pasadena, Texas, and when I say funnest, I mean most horrible, of course, is that it was home to one of the most infamous serial killers in history, mm. Dean Coral, who, along with his two teenage accomplices, murdered a minimum of 28 teenage boys between 1970 and 1973. This was going on between Houston and Pasadena. He lived in Pasadena, so like a bit of a history, this city. Sorry, Pasadenians who are watching this. And of course, this is all before I get into the main story of this video, but also Pasadena is home to one of the most infamous murders in history. When, in 1974, Ronald O'Brien, while taking his son and his son's friends trick-or-treating at Halloween, gave his own son poisoned candy. 
cyanide laced pixie sticks. Yeah, that's where the urban legend of poisoned candy comes from. Right here in Pasadena, Texas. His own wow. son, Timothy, passed away quickly. And of course, you know, they, as you can imagine, this raised huge fears in the community of, of Pasadena, like, like the urban legend goes, right? Somebody's handing a poison laced candy to their children. All of the parents in the city freaking out. However, the police soon became suspicious of old Ronnie boy over here and his story of how his son got the death sticks. When mm. during the investigation they discovered nobody in the community was actually handing out pixie sticks and when Ronald took the police to the house where he supposedly got the candy and the kids got the deadly candy, well, the person who lived there, the person who had allegedly given them the pixie sticks, he had an alibi. He was an air traffic controller and 200 people could confirm he was in work Halloween night. It was also learned that Ronald over here, in today's money, he was over $600,000 in debt and he could not hold a job. He had like over 20 in the previous 10 years. And it was also learned that he had, for his children, some good old... Of course. Oh freaking course, man. Life insurance every freaking time, y'all, when we watching Mike videos. But it's just like, damn, dude, you freaking child. And one thing I want to say, y'all, it I did not know that this, the origin story or the urban legend or whatever you want to call it originated from this dude in Pasadena, Pasadena, Texas, um, poisoning his child. As far as when I was growing up and going trick or treat, you know what I'm saying, with my friends and my mama and her friends, you know. I'm saying we all go out trick-or-treat as a group whenever we got back to the house before we could eat any candy our parents would dump all the candy out and be examining it and looking and seeing if one of these people house that we went to was trying to kill us or something like that is real and i know some of y'all when y'all was growing up y'all had that happen too i don't even know if it go on now because trick trick-or-treating is not like it used to be but some people still trick-or-treat but i'm pretty sure parents are still checking and making sure that ain't nothing going on crazy with the candy before they let their all uh, children eat it and i did not know it came from right here in pasadena with this crazy mother who killed his son that's wild over oh, well, some fucking life insurance it never fails when we watch a mic let's go and then the fathers took the children trick-or-treating Bates said O'Brien went to one house where no one appeared to be home, and after the children had scampered ahead to the next house, O'Brien came off the front porch carrying the pixie sticks. He was arrested, tried, and convicted, and at the end of which he was sentenced to death. A sentence carried out on March 31st, 1984. So, Pasadena, uh, quite a dark history already. It was here in 1990 that 14-year-old Regina K. Walters grew up. Regina was the daughter of Jerry Walters and Caroline Simpson, and she was the youngest of three children. She had an older sister, Diana, and an older brother, Brian. Now, tragically, though, her older sister, Diana, would pass away at only age 12, if you can believe that. Damn. Passed away by, you know, her own hand. Before she took her own life, she actually recorded a message on tape recorder to be left, you know, to be found. And it ended with a message to her parents saying, I hate you forever. Now, growing up, Regina dreamed of getting, getting away from Texas, getting away from this, you know, constant industrial atmosphere that was baked into the town, getting away from the people she saw everybody around her turn into and grow into. She didn't want to be one of them. She wanted to be something else. She wanted an adventure to see America, maybe even the world, and she thought she had met the man who would take her with him. Mm. His name was Ricky Jones, and he was a few years older than Regina. He was 18, but by all accounts, they were very much in love with each other. It was teen love, you know, both of them. It was their first all-consuming, passionate love. You know, they'd spend all day talking, all and all night, just talking about getting away from Pasadena and going out to either Mexico or out west to California. Starting fresh, just the two of them. They all, that was all they needed. What they wanted to be, they didn't know, but they wanted to find it, and they knew they wouldn't find it here. When in Regina's house, all they found was grief since Diana's passing. Ricky, a little older than Regina, but very soft-spoken, a quiet, kind-hearted fellow who kept to himself. He was ready to go. He had finished school, and so he promised to always take care of Regina. Now, though, the idea of going, well, it might not end well for, for old Ricky here, because he was actually on probation uh, when mm. they were you know, making these plans to just up sticks and get out of tent. He's actually on probation for theft, which means you can't exactly leave. And so, in secret, they packed 
their bags and they readied, ready to sprint away into the night. Regina, she lived with her mother as her parents had split up, but both still lived in Pasadena. And so a lot of time Regina would you know, divide her time between the two places. They'd split up, you know, shortly after their, their oldest daughter Diana had, had taken her own life. I mean, as you can imagine, that's quite something to be told after a 12 year old, you know, goes out that way and the, her final words are, I hate you forever. This was something her parents, her family, Regina herself, you know, they could never get over. And so that was also one of the big reasons why Regina just wanted to get away. Don't think I- Like seriously, man, can you imagine that your child committed the S word and the last thing they said before they did it, man, Jesus Christ. That, yeah, that would elf a family up and then this family would never get over that. I could blame her. Regina Walters was last seen on February 3rd, 1990 in her mother's apartment. The next morning, her mother, you know, went into Regina's room. How are you, Regina? She was not there. Empty room. She sees clothing is missing. That basically she sees all, all the signs of somebody having ran away. Ricky and Regina had left together. They had ran for the highway. See, one problem that they both had, Rick, Ricky and Regina had was... Well, Ricky didn't have a car, neither did Regina, and they didn't drive. So with only what their the? backpacks on their bags, it was Huffa and Tummit till they got to where, you know, they needed to go, where they wanted to go, but they hadn't even decided in their own head. They just anywhere but here. It wouldn't be easy, but it would be exciting. But in the meantime, of course, Carolyn had woke. Her mother, Carolyn, had woke to find Regina gone. Looking around the house, she can't find her. She goes into Brian's room, asks him, he hasn't seen her. She goes and calls Jerry, who lived in town. Her husband, Jerry Walters, no, she's not there. Then Caroline quickly goes to the Pasadena uh, Police Department to report her 14-year-old daughter missing to the police. That was on... This is, I mean, I, I, I at least thought that uh, the 18-year-old dude, I thought he had a car. You know what I'm saying? It's terrible that they was running away anyway, especially a little 14-year-old girl. But y'all running away on feet? Like, y'all literally running away. Where y'all gonna go? Like, that right there just already uh, make you believe that this is not gonna end good. I don't think it's good anyway for a little 14-year-old to be running away. But, man, you're literally running away on foot. That's crazy. On February 4th, 1990, when she had last been seen the day before, an officer was assigned to this missing teen's case. And, you know, the usual scale, the usual story. You got the, the flyers, missing persons posters... Police going around town and their cruisers looking to see if they can find her. They can see anything or if anybody else has seen anything. Soon though, a uh, ring ring came in, right? Regina had been spotted near the highway in the company of another older teen fella. And so, you know, Regina's family and the friends, they knew full well about Ricky. And so they put two and two together. It was pretty obvious what was happening. Their assumption was a reality. They had run away together. People were not happy, of course, even though Ricky was always described as a nice guy, quiet, just kind of kept to himself. I mean, in fairness, that Regina was too young for him. He was 18, she was 14. So at the same time, he was an adult who had ran away with a minor. People were thinking, this lad, he's stolen a child. Ricky and Regina ran, they tummed it, and eventually going along the highway, they got lucky, and a truck came up, saw them, honked the horn, slowed down, and allowed them to, to leg it to catch up. And lucky for them, it was room enough for two. Driver was this middle-aged guy. He looked fairly harmless. Um, he had glasses on, his hair was slightly receding. He was lanky, but he was wearing like a shirt, trousers, very, you know, clean. The cabin was, was meticulously clean, smelled good. His clothes had been freshly ironed and pressed. Basically, he looked like one of your dad's coworkers from the office. He opened the door, introduced himself as Dusty, let them in and off they went along the highway. They knew people were looking for them at this stage. They knew they would get in serious trouble if they got caught, but they didn't care. They just wanted to get away and start fresh away from everything they were leaving behind. Ricky himself, like he'd grown up in foster care. He'd been removed from his own parents at a very young age. He had family like all the way over in Indianapolis. So he didn't really have the ties that Regina had and the ties that Regina had, I mean, they were bringing her down and she just wanted to cut him. That was what they knew. But what they didn't know was that the truck they had just gotten into had a secret compartment in the back, just behind the cabin. That was a torture chamber. And the driver, Dusty, already had a long list of victims. It was over a month after Regina and Ricky were last seen on March 17th, that is a 1990, that Regina's father, Jerry, he got a ring ring. 
Now, Jerry, when the phone was ringing, assumed it must have been a friend or somebody he knew. See, Jerry, Jerry's number uh, was actually unlisted. Even some of his best friends didn't know his phone number. So he was obviously then quite shocked when he picked up the phone and there was a voice on the other end of the line that he did not recognize. The man asked immediately, first thing, am I speaking with Regina Walter's father? And Jerry drops everything, right? Because he's been looking for his daughter for over a month now with zero leads and zero tips since, you know, they, they had been seen near the highway. So he drops everything and is like, yes, yes, this is, this is he. What do you know? Tell me, what do you know about my missing girl? The man said he knew where Regina was. So, so Jerry, jumping for joy at this point. Amazing. But his next sentence poured ice water on Jerry's stomach. He said, I cut her hair. She's got short hair now. I left her in a barn loft. Jerry asked, is she still alive? And then the line went dead. Wow, dude, y'all can't tell me, Bean Team, this don't sound like something straight out of a freaking movie. Like, you can make a movie out of this story. And that dude who, uh, the truck driver who got many of victims that he didn't let come in his cab and got a torture table literally inside his fucking cab or his trailer or whatever, and he calling the daddy and saying, I done cut her hair and all this, this could be a freaking movie, man. And one thing I want to point out, and I already had felt uneasy about it, but since Mike ad addressed it, I agree totally with him. The fact that uh the dude 18 and she 14, you is pretty much a dope goddamn um uh, being with a child at that point. And then it's almost like you kidnapping that child, man. Even though she going on her own, she a child. You a dope at 18. That's why I was saying, like, I can understand him um running away, like that's still bad but the little girl that's the one i was look concerned i was most concerned about because it's a little freaking girl 14 you are a little girl man it'd been different if they was both 18 still would have been bad but i don't know let's go y'all this this one here is just building up and getting even crazier as we go along jerry tried calling back but the number was unavailable and then he went to the pasadena police to report what had just happened there had been no news and sightings of either Ricky or Regina since they'd ran away together, so this was, although it could be bullshit, some news. However, the attitude of that call, well, sounds like shit news to be fair. The police, however, they got tape recorders. They gave one to Jerry and they gave one to Caroline, just in case this, whoever he is, he calls back again, they can record his messages. And in fact, he did. He called back that night. He called, mm. this time he called Caroline. Now he was asking Caroline if they'd found her daughter, and I mean, he said she was in a barn loft and there's only about a million of them. So then he says, all right, I'll meet you in the morning at a convenience store near near your home in Pasadena. Caroline went there first thing the next morning and she's waiting in her car outside this convenience store. Only thing was she had told the police and a police cruiser had parked nearby. So nobody showed up. Now whether nobody showed up because this caller was actually bullshit or because they'd seen the police, police car nearby, nobody knows. Maybe nobody was ever going to show up regardless. That was, though, until he called again, arranging another meet. Now, this time there was no police car, or rather, the police were there, but they were in an unmarked car parked nearby, but again, no show. Caroline waited and waited and waited for nothing. The mysterious caller then called her yet again. In fact, he would call her multiple times over the next couple of weeks, and the police would always, you know, be trying to trace these calls from wherever this mysterious person was, because it was always the same voice. Now, a lot of times you wouldn't stay on the line long enough to be traced. Other times, though, you know, it would be traced back to Oklahoma City or up to Illinois or then right beside her house. The calls were coming from basically all around Texas and the Midwest. On the phone, he was basically said nonsense, shouting, sometimes trying to arrange another meetup, sometimes sexual things. But then, after about two weeks of these calls coming in, they abruptly stopped in April. I'm starting to think that those calls is just straight bullshit. You know what I'm saying, man? This somebody freaking trolling them in the worst way possible. I don't know if I even believe that that's actually the person who is behind um, her uh, disappearance. Let's go. Ricky and Regina have been missing for two months now with zero word other than this crazy son of a bitch who's calling in saying all sorts of weird ass shit. Who knows if he even knew anything about what really happened to Ricky and Regina. Maybe he was just some crazy, see you next Tuesday, he was getting a chub off, torturing a missing girl's parents. But the fact that he was able to call Jerry's number, which was an unlisted number, 
did strike people as odd. How would he have gotten that number? True. Unless he had gotten it from Regina herself. But the thing of it, he was a crazy son of a bitch who, to see you next Tuesday, he was getting his rocks off by torturing a missing girl's parents. He was telling the truth. He was the reason Ricky and Regina had gone missing. His name was Robert Benjamin Rhodes, and he was, slash is, because he's still stuck in there to this day, probably one of the scariest killers you've ever, or perhaps never, heard of. But I guarantee you've seen this picture. This picture yes. is of Regina Walters, and it was taken just moments before he murdered her. He began- What the fuck, y'all? I kind of got chill bumps, and I don't remember y'all, because y'all know we watch so many of these stores over here. I feel like this is from a Mr. Ball uh, video, or Lazy Masquerade, but we know this picture, man. But it's it, how I remember it, we never actually find out who actually killed this girl, who actually took this picture. Cause this was like over a year, two years ago, and I'm thinking that uh Mike has gave, given us an update on who actually was behind this. But yes, man, as soon as I seen that picture, I just got little chills. I know y'all know this picture. Let's go. And calling her parents shortly after taking this photograph, he had kept her alive for over a month. Robert Rhodes was a truck driver, very unimaginative considering his name, but also very imaginative by what the things he did to his victims. This will get dark. This will just heads up. You know me, I don't really like getting into the nitty gritty of violence and all that sort of thing, but even just like glossing over a surface level uh, of what he actually, what he literally did, um, it's... Uh, yeah. So let's go back. Let's go back and begin right at the thing they call the beginning and start with um, Robert Shithead Rhodes himself. This but is crazy. Before I continue, let me ask you this hot stuff. Do you ever get just God gosh damn? This is crazy, man. Mike gone to the commercial, y'all. But um, I know I re y'all remember that picture too, man. I don't know if it's from Mike. I don't know if it's from. I mean, not Mike. Uh, Mr. Ballin or the Lazy Man. But I feel like when we watched it, it, it was no conclusion. It was left as an unsolved mystery. Who actually? That was just the last picture we ever seen of her. But we don't know who actually did it. Or I just don't remember it. I don't know. But this is real interesting. Let's take it back right here and let's go. It started for free. You can also unlock even more features with premium. That's rocketmoney.com slash that chapter to get started for free. Thank you so much to Rocket Money for supporting and sponsoring that chapter. Now let's make like a rocket and um... Let's Robert do. Rhodes was born in November 1945 in the city of Council Bluffs, Iowa. Council Bluffs sits just across the Missouri River from Omaha. Back when he was just knee high to Adam's ball sack or whoever that saying goes. Back then, a population of about 40,000 people. But, you know, soon after that, when Robert was growing up, it would experience that big old post war baby boom. And the population would grow exponentially. Speaking of post war, Robert's dad was actually in the military. He was in the army and he was stationed in West Germany. Uh, this was at the time of Robert's birth. So, for the early years of Robert's life, he was actually raised by his mama. They. Rhodes. She herself raised Robert and his siblings in the city of Council Bluffs. It seems like they grew up the ni a, a nice normal family. You know, the kind of things you see in all serial killers, child Roonies was not there. Nice, loving family in this nice, good old, good old boy city. It seems like he was uh, close with his mother, though, you know, not in that like, weird, no, he wasn't too close, if you know what I mean. But this nice, normal family of the Rhodes, it went off-road. Right when uh, Daddy Ben Rhodes returned from Europe after he was uh, discharged from the army. He did, however, put this in your pipe and smoke it, come home like he was still fighting the Nazis in his own home. He had quite a temper and he wasn't shy, you know, with the fists. So the entire home life was uh, disturbed by probably a fairly already disturbed daddy-o. Once home, he got a job as a firefighter and, you know, in the public side at least, he was fairly, fairly respected. You know, he just got a home fighting a war in Europe and now he was back home in his city that was on the rise. But of course, people, you know, outside the Rhodes' front door didn't really know what went on behind it. But Robert always looked up to his dad as a hero, even when sometimes he'd be on the end of his dad's cuisine du jour, which was a knuckle sandwich. And during all this, Robert and his siblings were growing up fairly normal. They went to the local elementary, middle and high schools, and he was a decent student. He had friends, he played sports, he was in the singing clubs. 
pretty regular so far, though he did like bounce off the police once or twice while growing up, once at 16 and once at 18, but for fairly minor offences, once was for tampering with a vehicle, another time he just got into a fight. And, uh, you know, but nothing worrisome at this stage. Fairly normal, you know, lads being lads kind of stuff. However, it was after a clean and non-serial killery childhood that things took a dark turn for Robert Ben Rhodes. Right when he was just about to graduate high school, he was about 18 years of age at this point. It was the actions of his father, Ben Rhodes, that would turn this pretty, you know, average trajectory that Robert Rhodes was on and just take it, like, take a nosedive. All the way down. All the way down to Nopesville. See, when Robert was 18, his father was arrested for sexually assaulting a 12-year-old girl. Then, oh after posting bail, he was arrested a few months later for doing it again. He was what? arrested, made bail once again, but before uh, his, you know, his, this could come to trial, he decided to eat a revolver and diarrhea bullets at the back of his skull. So as you can imagine, this would have a profound effect on Robert. His dad, yeah. his hero, his dad, turned out to be a monster who had ended it all. A switch in Robert, done got flicked. He hadn't figured all that out yet though, so to get away from all the rumors and whispers and finger pointing in the small town of Council Bluffs, he wanted to fo follow in his father's footsteps, Robert Rhodes. Followed in Ben Rhodes' footsteps and he himself joined the military, he joined the Marines. Following his father's footsteps he did, down the staircase to hell. However, it was three years into his service in the Marines that he would be dishonorably discharged. He was based on the East Coast and he was caught red-handed during a robbery. So, out you get. He was out with his arse after that. It seems like he really did have this urge to kind of act out after his father's death and, you know, I guess what he thought would be the military, which would kind of keep him in line, it did the opposite of that and he just got worse and worse and worse. Over the next few years, Robert kind of sort of bounced around from job to job, never really finding his place. I mean, his place was supposed to be the military, but he was out in his arse. He didn't have an arse in his trousers after what they did to him. So eventually he moved back home to Council Bluffs, moved back into his family home. The whispers and the finger pointing hadn't stopped about old daddy-o, who, you know, Ben Rhodes had been a hero in the war. He'd been a firefighter and turned out, you know, so everybody knew him and knew what he had done and then what he'd done to himself. So the whispers and finger pointing back in Council Bluffs hadn't stopped, but Robert still went back. He actually ended up meeting a woman there and marrying her. And while he was there, he also went to, to, to college and he wanted to, you know, upskill himself. At this point, he didn't really know what was ahead of him, but he did know one thing about himself at this point. He liked violence and he had some urges that he really, hot diggity dog, just couldn't kind of help himself from acting out on. And this wasn't like, you know, into the deep end. This was like a toe in first and then maybe little foot and then jumping in cock first. It was around 19. That's what I was finna say, man. You know, you at first you put your just your little toe in the water. He just tried a little violence here and there. Before you know it, he diving head first in. You know what I'm saying, man? It's just like his upbringing was good. He was good as a child. From when his mama had him, then when his daddy got involved. But his daddy went completely off the deep end, man. That does change you when you realize that your one of your parents is one of uh, is one of the p words and uh, repeated p. -words word you know what i'm saying he did that to a 12 year old got out and did it again you know what i'm saying man so he had some trauma in his life but it's like dude i don't i don't know if i really can just solely blame it on that or just say he was just crazy from the beginning and one day he just started acting on his craziness i don't know let's go 1970 that Robert decided he couldn't do this anymore. He quit Council Bluffs for good, he quit college, he quit his wife and his son, who he had. He divorced them all, and he left, never to return. <laughs> they dodged a bullet, let me tell you. He tried to become a cop, but he failed the entrance exam, and he bounced from one job to another. He worked in warehouses, in stores, in restaurants, all that kind of stuff before ending up in Houston, Texas in 1973. He ended up as a truck driver, and he... Beep, beep. He loved being a truck driver. We will get to that. Another thing Robert oh. discovered is that he was, man, BDSM, right? That was the thing for, he thought BDSM was the dog's box, right? It was his favorite thing in the world. He jumped cock first into the local BDSM, burgeoning BDSM swingers community in Houston, Texas. Mad for it. He got into it more and more. And I mean, you know, the thing about BDSM is that you got the whips and the chains and all that stuff, but it is consensual. Two parties agreeing are both into it and they can stop whenever they want. It's completely consensual. Now, Robert wasn't into, was into the whips and chains. Consensual part though, he could kind of do without. Robert would marry again in Houston, 
unknown what her name was, but he really got off on watching her suffer. One time when she was in hospital with lupus, he was rocking it 24-7. She too would go on to say he was abusive, but torturing people, that was his cup of tea. He, he really found that out about himself. I guess he had a lot more in common with his dad than he thought originally. Here's a picture of him right. in his getup. Now this picture is actually from a Halloween party he attended with his wife. But I mean, this may as well not be because that was his gear, he didn't need to buy shit. His nickname was even Whips and Chains. His second marriage would end in divorce, yet again, and then he would meet his third and final wife. This was in the early 80s, and her name was Deborah Davis. They met at a bar, and the night they met, Robert was actually dressed as an airline pilot. Uh, apparently he thought that was the best way to meet women, was just like them, and just dress up as a job you don't have. I mean, I suppose a truck driver is kind of like an airline pilot of the roads. But he introduced himself, you know, giving a fake name. He said his name was Dusty and he flies planes all around the world. Nice to meet you. Probably not a bad scam. I mean, it's a shitty scam, but it probably did work. They began dating, and in fact, it would be months before she realized he was not, in fact, an airline pilot. He was described as charming and intelligent, though cunning was the word that was used a lot when describing Robert Rhodes, um, which kind of was a very different connotation to intelligent. Their relationship was quite sweet to begin, and though, of course, you know, when he told her he wasn't really an airline pilot, he was a truck driver, and his name wasn't Dusty, it was Robert, she was taken aback, obviously, as you can imagine, but, you know, she, she found herself falling head over heels in love with Robert. Then he started introducing her to the BDSM clubs and the, the swingers clubs and the whips and the chains and all that sort of thing, and they'd go to these houses where there'd be lots of people, you know, banging each other, and she would go into a room and find Robert having sex with somebody else, and she was a bit like, oh no. She would even witness him doing some illegal things. She was not keen on it, but he was just pressuring her into it the entire time, forcing her to attend these uh, little sessions. Things got like and see that why when she when she first realized he was lying to her the first time, man, claiming to be a freaking pilot. You know what I'm saying, man? When you you first meet somebody and they lying to you when you first meet them, best believe they gonna lie to you the, the, the whole time for the rest of the time that you know them. You know what I'm saying, man? You, it, the first impressions are everything. And if you meet a liar at the end, when you stop meeting them, they still gonna be a freaking liar, man. I don't. No man, I hate she even continued to be involved with this guy. This dude here is something else. Extreme at times, and he would get even more and more violent with her. But then at the same time, he would just be constantly love bombing her. They would eventually get married. One time, she came home to find a strange man in her house, and she was like, who's that? Robert said, listen, he's a sex slave I got for you. Lucky you. It's your lucky day. This is the house she shared with Robert and three kids of her own. And she wasn't into that at all. Uh, she did not appreciate this gift he'd given her. Talk about ungrateful. And of course, Robert would just get more and more abusive uh, with her. Every list, all the kinds of abuse he was doing, we don't need to get into it. But eventually, over the course of a couple of years, they, she would finally have, him, have enough. And she'd become estranged. Soon though, Robert decided to take his violence out on the road. Where, listen, nobody's gonna stop me out here. He loves trucking, he loves a lot of other things. Let's go book wild. This was in the late 80s. His MO, his modus operandi, look at me, was, well, he would be traveling all across America, on the highways all across America, so he could really be anywhere. And, I mean, the whole thing of, like, truck drivers being serial killers, he's, um, kind of a big dog. In that, so his MO would he be driving around and he would stop off, off at truck stops and he would spot what he called lot lizards. Lot, li lot lizards, he didn't invent it. It's a term basically used for um, sex workers or maybe sometimes hitchhikers who will exchange sexual favors in exchange for um, going somewhere or for money or whatever. And sometimes he would agree to take them where they needed to go. He's go on, hop in the rig. Man, ain't no telling how many people this man to kill, y'all. Because light lizards, they come a dime a dozen. You know what I'm saying? I ain't gonna even tell no lie, man. Like, any truck stop, if your truck stop in your city, I promise you, if you pull up to that truck stop right now, it's gonna be a lot, a lot, lot lizard, not even uh, a, a mile within a vicinity. Because another thing, if you notice about truck stops, what always is around truck stops, y'all? Whole freaking tails, mo freaking tails. You know what I'm saying? And you know what's in the motels? Light freaking lizards. Let's go. 
For a time, the trip would be perfectly normal, and his passenger, you would think, hey, he's a nice guy, you know, he's dressed well, he smells good, he's charming, he's intelligent, he knows about the world, and he ain't a creepy looking some bitch. The cab was clean. This will be fine. He'd even buy a lunch as he drove. So he'd be sitting there in the cabin, you know, munching away, wolfing in a burger and a Coca Cola or whatever, thinking this is great. However, it would be a little bit down the road as you got to that quiet space between cities that the conversation, which had, which had you know, been flowing, flowing before, it would suddenly stop. Your questions would be met with silence. It would be like he was a million miles away, but also in your face at the very same time. The way a vicious dog wouldn't respond, respond to your questions either. He'd shuffle in his seat a little, and the muscles that had been relaxed suddenly started tensing up, and the hairs on the back of your neck would stand up. Then he'd start talking about some dead girls he had read about in a newspaper who'd been found off a highway, or he had just heard about that other truckers had been talking about. Maybe other dead girls who had been who had been hitchhiking up until that point. He'd mentioned secret societies. Apparently, Robert Robert Rhodes was obsessed with secret societies, and he would mention one called the Laughing Death Society, which he said, "You know what they do? They just laugh at death." I think the only member may have been Rob Rhodes. Then, when the truck was in a lonely spot, he would pull off and park the truck just off the road. He would then whip out a knife. He would tell you to get into the back of the cabin or else this knife is going into you. In the back of his cabin, he had this little torture room set up. He had his little kit with chains and handcuffs and needles and all manner of toys that you can imagine, but you probably don't want to imagine. When the moment struck to either attach shackles after the woman had fallen asleep or at knife point, he then dragged them into the back of the cabin and would handcuff his victims to a bar, bolted to the ceiling of the truck. Then, as he drove, he would take breaks whenever the mood struck him to assault his victims and torture them. He would whip them on the front and the back, puncture nipples and genitals with needles and pins, use and insert all manner of toys, all sorts of sex toys on them. He would force them to drink their own pee. This would go on for weeks. He would shave their pubic hair, which was a trophy of his, and the more they screamed, well, that's what he wanted. His assaults would only get more brutal the longer he held them. And once he got bored, it would almost always end in death. Till he found his next victim at the next truck stop, and he would ready his black leather briefcase once again. One of these victims was 24-year-old Patricia. Candy was what she went by, Walsh. And her husband, 26-year-old Douglas Zuzkowski. They were a couple newlyweds from Seattle, Washington, and they decided they'd wanted to attend a religious workshop in Georgia. They didn't drive or have a car, so hitchhiking was the plan. It would be an adventure, they were newlyweds, so think of this as a honeymoon. This was in November 1989, but it would be shortly after they set out on this great adventure that all contact with them stopped. Now this is 89, so it's not like they had cell phones or anything like that, but friends, relatives would just, you know, start to wonder after a couple of weeks of not hearing from them, and then that wonder would turn to fear and dread. See, they had actually made it to El Paso, Texas. <laughs> it took them a surprisingly long time to get there, over a month. They still had quite a bit to go when, you know, well, didn't a nice friendly truck driver, hey, listen, where you want? You want to go to Georgia? Listen, I'm heading in that direction, be close enough, you know, you can find your own way there. Hop on in. And he, he was one guy and they were a couple, so it's not exactly like they were fearful of him, of him attacking them or anything like that, you know what I mean? However, a few hours into their trip, his demeanor changed and he pulled over. This time though, with two people, he whipped out a gun. He ordered the couple out of the, out of the truck into the woods, and then once they'd gotten quite a bit off the road, he shot Douglas in the head. Then when wow. Douglas was lying on the ground, he shot him more times in the head, and then he ordered Candy back into the truck. He kept her in the truck for over a week, by which time, they, by which time they'd gotten into Utah, then ran there and he ordered her out of a truck into a remote spot and he executed her. Wow. Another one of these women was 18 year old Shanna Holtz. She was from California uh, and he met her in California and she was looking for a ride to Fort Smith, Arkansas. Robert told her he was going to Texas and she said, well here, let's, let's probably be close enough. So in you get. Once again, she thought he was charming and harmless. Just some trucker, you know, she's a youngin. Just a trucker, you know, trying to do his good deed for the day after spotting this young hitchhiker milling around this truck stop. Once Shanna got into his truck, he pounced, attached a handcuff to each of her arms and each of her legs so she was spread eagle in the back of his cabin. After hours of torture, he would drive for a few hours, then more torture. When he had to make deliveries, he would turn up the radio in his truck to drown out the screams. 
though he would always insert a horse brindle around their neck and into their mouth so that they couldn't make much noise. Now, you know, serial killers, they'll often take trophies of their victims, whether it be clothing or sometimes bits of skin or teeth or jewelry all, or, or whatever. Robert Rhodes' thing was hair. When he had these women in his truck, he would often cut their hair short. He cut Shanna's hair short while he was kidnapping her just on the side of the highway. After keeping her in the truck for about a week, he began to sort of trust her. He would let her ride up in the front, in the front of the cabin, though she was mm. always naked and like kept shackled. He actually kept her for two whole weeks entirely when one time she managed to escape after he didn't uh, when a handcuffs he put on her, he didn't put it on tight enough. And so she ran screaming towards the highway, just begging for her help, flagging down any carriers that could. And eventually she flagged one down and the police officers arrived not long after. So the police And that's one thing that happened to a lot of these serial killers who be uh killing people over time and just doing the same thing and to just different people, you know what I'm saying? Eventually they start with they uh the people that they be kidnapping and stuff and holding hostage, eventually they starting to lighten up. They start to lighten up. It's going to be that certain person where they start to give a little more leeway to. You know what I'm saying, man? And that's when they end up getting caught, when they lighten up. Like when he started letting her sit in the front of the cab. And I'm glad he did all this. Thank God he did all this. I'm glad he lighten up. But that's just a recurring thing, man. They start lighting up. And that's when they, instead of lighting up, maybe I should be saying slipping up. That's when they start slipping up and effing up. And I'm glad that he did F up, man. It's... It, this one of those cases, y'all, of videos where I feel like he gonna get life in prison uh, or die. Get to, I, I pray he get the death penalty. I, I don't feel like this is one of those ones where he gonna be let free. You know what I'm saying? When they get him, they gonna get his ass. But it's like, even though they got him, I don't even if they give him the death penalty, he has did so many freaking killings, have just did so much horrible ish to his like, man, I still don't feel no better. You know what I'm saying, man? Like, Jesus freaking Christ. This dude is, I'm telling you, he could literally be straight out of a horror movie. Police arrived and they spoke with her, and she told told the officers that the person who had kidnapped her and kept her for two weeks, his name was Dusty. And she eventually was able to give the police a description of the truck he drove and the company that he worked for and yada yada yada. The police went to the trucking company, they asked, do you have any truck drivers by the name of Dusty? And they said, well, yeah, we, his name is actually Robert Rhodes, but he often goes by Dusty. The police nabbed him. They, they, then, they then brought him into a police lineup in the station. And you know, had Robert Rhodes was there, and then there was a couple of other guys, and then there was a two-way mirror, and then there was police officers, detectives, and Shanna Holtz. And Shanna, pick out who's the guy who kept you in his truck. She went, she looked at each each person there, and she said he wasn't any of them. The police knew one of them was. They they knew who it was. They could see, they knew that it was Ben Rhodes who had kept her. He matched all her descriptions. But looking at Shanna, they could just see the fear in her eyes that she just wouldn't identify him. In her mind, she was thinking if he ever got out, well, she already knows what he's capable of. So she thought he will kill her if he gets out. Just like Candy and likely the countless women before her, Shanna had suffered the most unthinkable abuse while shackled in the back of Robert's cabin, kept there for two weeks as they drove and drove and drove, consistently being subjected to the unimaginable. Traumatic wouldn't even begin to cover it. So she lied. So she lied to the police, said it wasn't him. And he was let go. The police. That is crazy, y'all. And I'm not even blaming her, man. But that is crazy, man, that she didn't go on say it was him. That just lets you know the type of mind control that he was having over his victims and the type of torture that he was putting them through. Where well, she was scared to even admit that it was him to the freaking police when she had the opportunity. And now he back free. Oh, my God. Obviously, they couldn't pursue. But they noted all the details of Robert Benjamin Rhodes... You know, everything about him, his address, his company, everything, because they were fully sure this was would not be the last time they would ever hear of him. They were bang on to rights. If you can believe it, he would come up again. That would be in April 1990. This was in Casa Grande, Arizona. As you can see, he was getting around. We ain't done with the whole story yet. This is on April 1st, 1990. It was in the very wee hours of April 1st, 1990, an Arizona Highway Patrol officer spotted a truck parked off the interstate just outside these city limits, and its hazards were blinking away. 
So the officer is driving along, it's at very wee hours of the morning, and he's thinking to himself, Jeez, that truck, I wonder if everything's alright. You know, maybe I should just, why not just pop over, knock in the L cabin, see, see if, if everything's good here. So, he pulled it, parked up behind the truck, started flashing the lights, then he got out, whipped out a flashlight, was examining the truck and walked up in the pitch blackness of the night. Just going up to see what the matter is, just make sure everything's okay. Looking up, he could see the light of the cabin spilling out of the front of the truck, but he can see like the light moving as if there is some kind of commotion or, or activity inside the truck. So he steps up on, on the runner of the truck and looks in and what he sees... I don't think he had words for what he would see because I don't, I don't have words for it either. He saw a woman completely naked chained to the wall, the inside wall of like the sleeper area in the cabin. And that was Robert's little torture chamber. And she saw the officer looking in the window and she just began screaming at him. So the officer then ran around to the driver's seat, whipped out his gun and opened the door. He saw the, the man inside the truck try and hide behind the cabin, but he obviously just whipped out his gun and demanded he get out, got out. The man did calmly and said, listen, you know, I'm not gonna cause any trouble. He calmly got out of the truck and he was arrested right there and then, and that woman was rescued. She was taken to the hospital and the man, Robert Rhodes, was taken to the police station. Now the victim, was her name was Katie, well, her name was Katie Ford, but that's not her real name. Her real name has never been, been given away. And she said she'd been in there for a couple of days by this point in his little torture chamber. She told the police that while he was torturing her, he told her that he had been doing this for 15 years, 15 long ass years. Now when the police though then went to speak to Robert, he just told, you gonna believe her bullshit. She's just some crazy, you know, lot lizard. She's talking gibberish, wouldn't worry about her. She's way back to bed, invited back to the Jeep. I think that's about as far as I've ever gone. And in this garage is not playing with the full day. This was, you know, she was just gonna pay me for taking away, taking her away, and she's gonna pay me in nature, as they say. And so, you know, things just got a little bit too kinky maybe for her, but it's all good. Well, the police seeing the way she was, how she was acting, the fact that she was chained up inside his cabin, then arrested Robert Rhodes for uh, aggravated assault, sexual assault, and kidnapping. The cops then called his employer, his, his boss at the tr trucking company, and, you know, informed them, they arrested one of your employees, you know, in his truck, yada, yada, yada. And as they were on the phone to him, telling him about this incident just outside of Casa Grande, Arizona, the, uh, Robert's boss was like, oh, hey, that's kind of odd. Because, you know, just a couple of months previous, there had been another weird incident regarding this guy. Nope. He'd been called in for a police lineup about imprisoning somebody else. Now, he, charges were never filed against him, and he was allowed to walk a free man. She said he didn't do it, but it's just weird that... It's weird it would happen twice, in a space of a couple of months. <laughs> Very weird. This motherfucker is a repeat offender out here, y'all. He should have been locked up forever for the first time, man. Interesting. The police then went to his truck to just scope it out and scope out what the frick they could find out in the back of that cabin because there was some sick shit going on back there. I'm not even gonna... I, like I said, I don't want to get into details because it's very fricked up. But they went into the back of the cabin and they're having a look around, probably trying not to touch anything. And then they find a camera tucked away just in the back of the cabin. So they get, get the camera out and they get the roll of film out and they, they go to get it developed. See, they had a good feeling there was more here than just some depraved truck driver, that he was a lot worse than what he'd been, I mean, what he had been caught doing was pretty bad, but they thought it could be worse. So they got his film and they got it developed and it started showing photos of women, lots of women, all in varying states of distress. Most of the pictures have never been released, so you can imagine. Police from all over America were given the word about this guy and those photos they found. The FBI came in and joined in on the fun. In the meantime though, Roberts took a plea deal and got six years for the kidnapping of Katie Ford, who he was caught with. And the police remembered, you know, what she had told them, that he had been doing this for 15 years. And now with all of these photos, that was starting to ring a little bit true. And so they began matching the photos they'd found, you know, two missing women or, or Jane Doe's bodies of, of murdered women that remained unsolved. And it's, they started matching them up and they started getting like flags from all over America. It would take some time for a lot of them to be solved, but to go back to the beginning, one of those photos was of Regina Walters. That's correct. Multiple, there was a few of those photos of Regina Walters herself. 
That's crazy, y'all. I promise you, man. And I know y'all remember seeing that photo from, a, uh, I think it's Mr. Baller, man. I can't remember. But I know y'all remember seeing that shit, man. But at the time, we did not know who did it. It's crazy now to know that she was just one of his many freaking victims. Wow. It was in September 1990 that a farmer just outside of Greenville, Illinois, he had an old barn on his extensive property and he was actually going to have that old uh, barn burnt down by the local fire department as, you know, it was old and it was pretty decrepit and it was sort of falling apart. So, but one day in this September of 1990, he's like, you know what? It's going to be burnt down in a couple of days. Let me just go in there, check on it. Make sure I didn't leave anything behind. There's nothing here living in it or, or whatever. He goes to just snoop around. It was as he was climbing into the loft of that barn. He was looking around and then in the corner on the floor, he sees an almost skeleton figure just lying there. The authorities, when they arrived, they could tell it was, uh, it was a young woman, a teen child almost. She'd been there for, for a, quite a while at this point and she had been murdered. She had a wire twisted so tightly into her neck. It was still embedded in the skin. The body was processed Damn. and then the dental records were taken to try and identify, you know, who, who, who this was. This Jane Doe, it did the rounds and it eventually landed with the missing persons unit of the Pasadena Police Department. And they were able to match the dental records with that of Regina Walters. Initially, they actually thought Ricky may have killed her, that they ran away together and that he had killed her. Now, what they didn't know was that they had actually already found Ricky's body, but it was a John Doe at this point. They hadn't identified it as Ricky's buddy. Mm. So they're thinking, Ricky, he has family in Indianapolis. You know, this is on the way there. He must have killed her after they ran away together. And then yada, yada, yada. He's gone off somewhere himself now. But then the police officers from various varying departments and the FBI putting together what they knew and the photos were eventually able to identify the woman in those photos was Regina Walters. And now they'd found her body. Pretty clearly it became, it became known that that was Robert Rhodes who had murdered her. Soon after running away, Ricky and Regina had gotten into Robert's cabin and he did his usual MO. He was happy, charming, his grand old self. But then after driving for a couple of hours, a few hours, about four hours north from Pasadena, he ordered them out. Just like he had done to Candy and Douglas, got them out and he shot Ricky in the head because Ricky was just in the way. What he wanted was Regina. He kept Regina in his cabin for over a month. She was actually the, the longest victim he kept in there. And he cut her hair just like he did the others. Regina Walters was actually uh, seen, she had been seen in Chicago by other truckers who had spotted her, but of course they didn't know who she was and that she was a missing person down in Texas. In fact, some would say that when they saw her, they thought she was a boy because he cut her hair so short, but she was standing outside of his truck by herself. That's like the hold Robert would have on his victims that they wouldn't even try and run away because of what he was doing. They were more scared of what he would do if he got them again. Eventually he took her to this abandoned barn and killed her after taking these photos. After they raided Robert's apartment, they found Regina's notebook, her diary. That's how he was able to contact her parents and torment them. Ricky's body was found just outside Harleton, Texas. They had been driving north and four hours into the trek. That's when Robert pulled over with his gun. Ricky had actually been found in May of 1990, months before Regina was, though he remained a John Doe for over two years, if you can believe that. So Robert was in prison for the abduction of Katie Ford and almost as he was approaching parole eligibility, he was indicted with Regina's murder. His trucking log put him in the same place as those calls made to Regina's parents had come from. And so he knew his goose was cooked. He took a plea deal in 1992 and he was given a life sentence instead of the death penalty. He wouldn't be charged with Candy and Douglas's murder though until the, the early 2000s. Their bodies had actually been found and identified years previously. But uh, it was, in fact, it was just on a hunch that one officer was able to match the bullet wounds found in their body with bullets that had been found in his cabin and Robert's cabin when he was arrested. So again, he was charged with their two murders, but once again, before, yeah, you know, he go to trial, he took a plea deal, he pled guilty to, to their two murders, he got an extra two life sentences, but he wouldn't be sentenced to death. And so Robert Benjamin Rhodes is confirmed to have killed three people. Regina, Candy, and Douglas. He did unimaginable to, things to the women, the two women who just managed to escape, and he certainly killed Ricky as well, but he's never been charged with that, as there's just never enough evidence to link him, but, you know, we know he did it. 
man has confirmed that he killed three people. Multiply that three at least by ten. At the very least, he, I feel like he killed like thirty people, man. Because like I said, man, those lot lizards, man. He he was going to those different truck stops, and I believe he got a lot of them in they ca in, in his cabin. And it was kind of proven by all those pictures he had by different women. It just ain't you. They just can't prove that he actually killed them. But I feel like you got to multiply that three. That's confirmed by ten. And just to talk about highway serial killers for a moment, because really Ben Rhodes, he's the quintessential version of one, but there's a lot out there. So much so that the FBI, they had to create and are currently running a highway serial killings initiative to tackle them across the US. And even before, you know, I've mentioned places like the Highway of Tears in Western Canada, where it's believed they're also, unfortunately, all too active as well. Former FBI agent Frank Figluizzi recently released a book titled Long Haul Hunting the Highway Serial Killers and in it he states that the FBI has a list of 850 unsolved murders believed to have been done by truckers. 850, mother, mother of God. See, sorry about this, it's like regular ass truck drivers who are just there doing their job, but that's a big ass number. The suspects they currently have are in the 450 range. So the actual number of killers and serial killers is unknown, but enough to, to cause a fright. The people exploiting the seams along the edge of society, where, where cultures and states merge, striking out on their urges, because hey, you know, they're never going to see these people again. Or in Rhodes's case, we'll be taking them along for the ride against their will along a highway to hell. Wow. You know, once man. they're done, they continue along the river across to another highway never to be seen again, disappearing into the endless traffic and asphalt. Robert Ben Rhodes, probably one of the most notorious to have done it, and done it for a long time. It's believed that he killed up to 50 plus women in his days as a truck driver, spread all across the United States. By the way, he was what he was doing to his victims, he certainly has. He had been very experienced, and the only known victims of his were obviously Candy, Douglas, Regina, Ricky, uh, Shanna Holtz, and then Katie Ford. And that was all in a very short amount of time. And he told, you know, Katie Ford that he'd been doing this for over 15 years, since the mid 70s, when, you know, around the time he'd started being a truck driver. So there's probably a hell of a lot of John and Jane Doe's linked to Robert Rhodes that we just don't know about. His truck logs place him in areas where there are up to 50 unsolved murders. Same time, same place. And that's only from 1987 to 1990. He said he had been doing this since the mid 70s. The FBI say that at his peak, he was killing up to three women a month. He's probably one of the most Damn. prolific killer killers out there that we know very little about. And I don't think those numbers are bullshit to be honest because this guy is nightmare fuel. You can probably guess why while researching this, it keeps you up at night and definitely makes you think about those long desolate roads. So, um, sleep well. Hmm. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it really means the world to me. I uh, hope you enjoyed this old video and uh, laugh. Yeah, listen, the next video will be up next Tuesday, so please look forward to that and give it a go. Um, but until then, if you're looking for more of that chapter stuff, you can check out the That Chapter Patreon. It's two bucks a month and you get early access to all videos and there's a playlist of exclusive videos there too. It's also a Patreon-only Discord. And let's not forget about the That Chapter podcast, which has a brand new podcast exclusive episode out every Monday morning. There's like, what, 80 episodes out there at the moment. So if you're looking for some more, give it a go. But until the next whole episode, which um, I'm not sure what the next episode will be about, but probably something creepy and disturbing and spooky and scary. So look forward to that. But until then, please take care of each other and yourselves. Cause you know what? We talk about all these dark ass things. But I love you. Mike out. Mike out. It is always a delight when we come back to Mike, my brothers and sisters. And all I got to say is this, man. I will never look at truck drivers the same again. Like, seriously, man. I will never look at freaking truck drivers the same again, man. Even if I'm driving down the road, I'm going to be thinking about the big 18 wheeler beside me. Is that a freaking killer? They got a, a, a victim in the back of his cab. And you know what I'm saying? It's just like somebody, these stories just make you think like that. And then the fact that Mike said it was like over 850. The, uh truck drivers or or devs that's linked to possible truck drivers it's like what the freak and then it's also so crazy too 
y'all and i told y'all before but i tell y'all again that i work at a I work at U.S. Foods, which is basically like a food di distribution company or whatever. Long story short, story long, we unload 18 wheelers that have food products on it. You know what I'm saying? And these 18 wheelers are driven by truck drivers that we only really see like once in our lifetime because, you know, they come drop the food off. You never see them again. They just traveling all across the road. And now I got to go to work thinking that what if that goddamn truck driver got somebody in his goddamn cab that he don't even supposed to have you know what i'm saying it just make you think like that or oh, am i crazy y'all i know i ain't crazy y'all got to be crazy too because that's why y'all listen to my crazy ass long story short short story long but no man seriously this one right here is like whoa dude this dude here was beyond off the charts and like I said earlier too, man, he got the life sentence as we speak now. He's still living. But even if he would have got the death penalty, I it, he didn't kill so many people, man. So I don't, it don't, it, it, however he died, when he died, don't even matter, man. Because he have killed so many people, man. Mike said that he believed, it's believed that he killed at least 50. And I said that you got to at least multiply that three times 10 will give you 30. But shit, man. If he was doing it really over like 15 years, then you factor in that they said that they think at one point he was killing like three women a month. Man, he his, his death uh, count might be over uh, 100, especially when you factor in the men that he was also luring in just to kill them so he can keep the girl and torture her for as long as he wants to then do the same thing to them. This dude, I'm telling y'all, man, some of this stuff could be freaking movies, y'all. This stuff be out of movies. And I don't know, maybe it was all uh, mike channel that we seen that video from man with the uh that picture that picture has always ever since we watched that video from from whoever it was mr balling adrian from coffee house crime or uh, the lazy man lazy masquerade or mike from that chapter i don't freaking know but ever since we had watched that video that picture always sat in my brain so as soon as i seen it i started to get chills like holy ish because like i said i don't remember it being uh solved at that time but this dude he'll had a whole bunch of more stuff going on than even just her it's man my brothers and sisters i digress i'm for the go let y'all go y'all see i just went on a whole freaking tangent about this one and we have already been here long enough man so i'm gonna let y'all go now for real i appreciate y'all coming on back as always and before y'all leave just please 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 hit that like button comment subscribe and do all that if you ain't did that yet and i'll see y'all tomorrow and i think we're gonna go back to our homeboy kyle from dial trip but until then my friends i also need y'all to remember this love peace and happiness Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.